Here is another recent dump find. This is a Sony mini stereo system. We have two speakers as I take off the cover. You can see these are some nice two-way bass reflex speakers. The main unit consists of two separate components that are connected with a special cable. Judging by the design of this, I'd say this is from the early 2000s. Seems to be a somewhat higher-ended system. I'm not really a fan of how this looks, though. I don't like this almost square display. And then the buttons are arranged in this triangle. And this design is copied down here. Uh, this is the receiver and CD player right there. This down here is purely a cassette deck, which doesn't have a display. This is just a window to see the cassette. Now, as I turn on power to this, you can soon find out there is a lot wrong with this system. The CD drawer is only the first thing as I turn this on. Yeah, as I turn this on, yeah. Something makes an awful lot of noise. The CD drawer keeps opening. And, well, really the only thing that does work is the tuner. Let me give you a very quick sample. As you can hear, the tuner does work, and I better don't play too much of that because otherwise there will be copyright problems. So this is, well, I guess you're all going to agree, not really something worthwhile, except when we take a look at the back of the unit, it suddenly gets really interesting. Here is the back, and I guess you can already tell what's so special about this system. The amplifier is built into the right channel speaker. So this receiver only has an audio output. Standard RCA cable runs over to the input of the amplifier. This is a stereo amplifier. There is the left channel speaker output, which runs over here. Left channel speaker is just a standard passive speaker. Power is supplied to the amplifier via this weird sideways mounted switched outlet on the receiver. This right here, by the way, is the system connector connecting the cassette deck to the receiver. And that's it, basically. So you can probably already tell what I'm thinking. Just get rid of these ugly half-broken components and use the speakers with the built-in amplifier as some standalone amplified speakers, for example, for a computer. All you really need is to add a volume control somewhere. All the screws marked with an arrow have been removed, so I can now take out this amplifier module. And straight away we can see this is a nice design. This runs to the power LED on the front, this runs to the speakers, and both of these are socketed, so I can take out this entire module without any problems. Looking down into the speaker, we can see this was nicely put together, but it sure isn't any high-end. The woofer is magnetically shielded, which is very nice. So I can put these speakers right next to old-school television monitors, and I don't have to worry about any magnetic fields. Now, the tweeter is not magnetically shielded, but the magnetic field coming from that tiny little magnet will be so weak, I won't have to worry about that, I don't think. The crossover, rather disappointingly, is just a single capacitor inside this heat shrink tubing up there. The base reflex port on camera kind of looks like it was made from cardboard, but really it's made from plastic, and now you can decide which one is better, cardboard or plastic. There is just a tiny little amount of damping material inside this envelope, so it's like a cushion 
that's been glued into here. And I wonder, is this even going to do anything? It seems like such a tiny little amount. Then up front on the circuit board we have the power LED. And in the back where the amplifier module mounts we have this foam gasket as a seal. And here is the amplifier chassis. Power comes in right here, obviously, goes through a fuse and into a rather decently sized transformer. There is a rectifier bridge, we have a 6800 microfarads at 25 volts capacitor. So this is not running on a split power supply. The consequence of that is down there we have some speaker output coupling capacitors. And these very annoyingly are only 470 microfarads. So these will quite considerably limit the base output of the amplifier. But then again, considering these are just some small speakers, I don't think that's going to matter. The items up here seem to be related to the power LED that connects right there. And then the actual amplifier, that is a real work of art. Look at that. They split the circuit board into three sections, joined those together with these wires, so they were able to uh, basically wrap the amplifier board all around like this. So this right here is the main amplifier board. On this board we have filter networks for the inputs and output. And then right here are the input and output connectors. Now, rather disappointingly, it's really difficult to take this apart. The amplifier is using two ICs, one IC per channel, and those ICs are sandwiched in between the heatsink in the back, which there is some, uh, should be able to see that insulation material and heatsink grease. And then in the front, there is this copper plate. And the copper plate is also soldered into the circuit board. So I don't really see any way to get this apart without completely destroying it to be able to get some part numbers from those amplifier ICs. So that's very disappointing. I don't really feel like pulling this all apart because then I'll have to uh, redo the heat sink grease and insulation and all that. And Well, even if you took this out, you'd still have the copper plate in the way probably have to unsolder that. Yeah, so it's just going to be a bit of a drama just to be able to read the part numbers on those ICs. There is the other one. So I'm afraid to say I guess we won't be able to uh, get any more detail on the amplifier, which is very disappointing. Anyway, uh, since this is a Sony device, I will now go through and check all the solder joints. I got the amplifier board unfolded to inspect all the solder joints and the good news is this thing wasn't too bad. I did find a few solder joints that were like half bad but I didn't find any totally bad solder joints so that's good. Still I redid quite a few solder joints including the ones of these connecting wires because obviously these will be under a lot of stress when I go ahead and try to fold this back together which uh, might take a little patience. Oh, There we go. That's that. And then uh, also uh, on this board I resoldered a few joints but there wasn't anything bad on here. Using this setup that allows me to control the volume, I've now been testing the speakers for a while and unfortunately there is a problem. Now I have the fluorescent ceiling lights turned off so we don't have the usual buzz coming from them. There is just this incandescent light bulb which is silent. If I now get close to this speaker, you can hear
This thing is buzzing like crazy. And I'm pretty sure it's the transformer in there. That's annoying. I now have the amplifier module removed from the speaker once again. It's only connected to the mains. The speakers are disconnected, so there is no way the buzz is coming from those. Also, there is no way the buzz is the result of the transformer's magnetic field and the speaker's magnetic fields interfering with each other. No, this has got to be this transformer. I have also tightened down all the screws I could find in this module. That didn't help with the buzz. So, the only source of the buzz that's left over is the transformer itself. And now, it is warm, but I wouldn't say it's too hot. So I don't know what the fault could be. See, the thing is, this is not just because you hear the buzzing during quiet sections of music playing through the speakers. No, I'm not comfortable with this amount of buzz in any piece of equipment. This is wrong. This, this transformer is bad. I'm pretty sure about that. Now, thankfully, it is just a standard 12-volt transformer, so I can try to replace it, but that's going to be for another video. So, until then, thank you for watching.